I had an epiphany. You never made a reservation for it, did you? Did you know it was coming, like, beforehand? You called up the hotel. And, I think I need a room for four hours. And bring in the candles, Kenny G music. I'm going to have an epiphany. I'll try to make it clean, you know. But no, it just sort of breaks into your storyline, yeah? It's like a vertical insertion. It stops your linear little narration. But usually, if you notice, if if you've ever had an an event of one, it usually ends at the point where your mind arises and says, I just had this incredible epiphany. Yeah? So, the mental narrative or the, the mental reaction to its absence is to claim it as an experience. So, in this sense, right now, they're seeing, everyone in this room is seeing, like I'm seeing all of you, and I would call you a you, but every, and you would see me as a you, yeah, but everyone is just seeing, the act is just seeing, yeah, now, when the act is seeing, and there's, my mental reaction of interpreting is, I'm seeing you, yeah, and the same thing, when the act of seeing is noticed, the, the first thing, if I asked you, if you asked, well, who's seeing? You would say, I'm seeing. Yes? But then if you asked the next question, well, who's that I? You would say, me. Yes? And that me is just a you identified. It's an object. Just like you see me as a you, I see you as a you. This you that you see, I call me. But actually, it's seeing. Seeing is prior to that. The seeing is always so, and then there's a mental reaction to the seeing, which is it claims it. So, the mind always wants to put you prior to the seeing, so that you are who's seeing. Yeah? You are who's conscious, so then consciousness is not sensed as all there is, but it's sensed as an as a attribute you have or don't have, based on what you or don't do. You do or don't do, yes? So now... Seeing or consciousness becomes an experience of being conscious or unconscious based on what you do or don't do. So in a sense, in recovery, we call that playing God. So the mental, re- the mental process that produces a sense of self and claims everything, it claims its own absence, like an epiphany is its absence, but it claims it and says, I had a great epiphany. And then it goes and judges other epiphanies to the epiphany it thought it had, and then it puts it on a little spiritual mantle and says, come on over, look at the size of that freaking epiphany I caught. Look at that freaking thing. And then it tells you a story of how I caught it. I was at the Himalayas or something like that. And then you want to reduplicate that. You think you're going to do the same thing and get the same thing. But it had nothing to do with it, you. It was your absence. That was the event. But the mental reaction to it comes up and claims it. So now it becomes an experience you had. So seeing is constantly going on, and the mental reaction to it is, I'm seeing. Yeah. Which is true, I am seeing. The same eye that's seeing out of your head, and your head, and your head, and your head, that same eye is seeing. But the mental reaction takes that eye to be a me, which is an identification as a body. Yes? So there's the recognition of I'm seeing, because that's what's going on, but the recognition is claimed, and it calls the I a me, which is really a you. I'm just a you that's been identified. I call it me. I'm an object. I take myself to be a you. And when my system of thought and interpretation contemplates me, it contemplates me as a body. When it thinks about me, in the past, how does it think about me as a body? When you go into a past event, how do you see yourself in that past event other than as a body? And when you're worrying about you in the future, you're worrying about you as a body. Yeah? So the system of thought that most of us are relying on for our navigational skills here is totally determined by its center, the system called self-centeredness. Its whole system is centered on being a self, which is a a you that's called a me, which claims the I. So the I is always naturally inviting us 
to recognize the absence of what we're taking ourselves to be. Every freaking second that there's consciousness that you're up, there's an invitation of your own absence. And that's the presence. That's the sense of presence, is seeing that I'm not that. Yeah? When you see that I'm not that, there's nothing else to see as what you are. Yeah? If, you see, if you think you're going to see what you are, you're really seeing what you are from what you're not. But this way, when you see what you're not, that's all you need to do. Because as soon as you see what you're not, that's what you are, seeing. Yeah? It's so beautifully clean. Yeah, so, it's like St. Francis says, what's looking is what you are looking for. So here you are, sitting here. Okay, what's looking, or what's seeing. So what's seeing is seeing, yeah? And <laughs> what's looking, or what's seeing, is the you that's looking for. How could that be? The you is me, which is a body, and a brain. And I was born, I'm going to die. As soon as that you is taken to be a me, it cannot see the I. Because it's looking at the I as a you. It takes the you to be the subject, and I now is like something called consciousness. Like an object that you are going to know. <laughs> it's pointless. <laughs> yeah? The whole point is to see your absence. When you get to the point I'm not that, that's that. There's nothing more to do. Whatever arises cannot possibly be you because there's a seeing of it. Yeah? Just like they always say in, the, in these circles, the eye can never see itself. So seeing can never be the seen. Yes? It's only seeing. When we have a sense of seeing, the mind's immediate reaction is there must be a seer. But in this case, there's no seer. There's just seeing. It's just a verb going on. The mind wants to make it a noun. I'm the seer, and make the verb a, a verb that the noun does. Yeah? I'm seeing, I'm hearing, I'm feeling, I'm tasting, I'm touching. Like Buddha said, when you see, well, I don't know what he said, you know, but supposedly he said something. But it was, you know, it took 300 years to put it in a paper, but he's, he supposedly said, when you see, see, when you hear, hear, when you feel, feel, when you taste, taste, when you touch, touch. That's it. That's conscious contact. Consciousness is in contact. Hear how? Seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, and touching. Yeah? Now, the mental reaction to that is, I'm seeing, I'm hearing, I'm feeling, I'm tasting, I'm touching. And because I claimed it, now it has the right to riff over it. I don't want to see what I just saw. I should be seeing something different. I go on and on and on and on, and incredible. It's like when you were a kid. When you, when you were a kid, if you were in an abusive situation, did you walk around your house and say, you know, I think this room is too small. I think I, wanna, I need a bigger room. I want like a north-facing window when I was four years old. And I didn't, take a, I didn't do an inventory on my mother and father. Oh, my mother is very big. You know? I don't like the way she looks. I definitely don't like the way she dresses. You know, I wasn't, I didn't have any idea that things could be different. That was the freedom. Yeah? In other words, when I was here, there wasn't a mental there that I thought I could be at. So I was here because there was no mental there I could go to. And I wasn't thinking, should I meditate today when I was three and four years old? Or I wasn't looking at, oh, what's the next workshop? I've got to sign up for that month-long retreat. There was an immediacy to life, yes? When you were playing with ants, that's what was happening. There wasn't like a narrator, will I be playing with ants next week? No, there's none of that going on. There was just an immediacy. You must have felt it. Yeah. yeah, there was a sense of something. And in that state, wonder and awe was a frequent visitor. Yes. There was, you could be enthused by 12 army men. I played for, with 12 army men three years under the same apple tree. <laughs> My mother just opened up the back door, bing, and I was out with Wayne Griffith, and that's all. And she called me to, to eat. If I wanted to eat, I'd come home. If I didn't, I didn't. But I was just playing and playing and playing and playing. What happened? The mental, see, they even said now that the baby has no sense of other for the first year, year and a half. The sense of self hasn't arisen yet. 
the sense of self is actually produced by a mental process. It is, yeah? It produces a feeling that surrounds a thought of being a self. And so you take bodily feelings to be the authentication of what you are. You take the way you feel as this, which is brought to you by consciousness, yeah? You take that feeling of this to be what you are. You don't take what's causing the feeling of it, but the it, yeah? So here's the it, and here's the feeling, and then there's what's having the feeling or seeing the feeling. The mind goes to this end. It says, what I'm feeling is what I am, not what's feeling, yeah? Because I already called what's feeling me. So I get this me gets verified by what I'm feeling. But really, what's seeing yeah, is consciousness, and it's producing effects through the body, because there's an awareness, and then we're taking the body effects to authenticate our beingness. It's incredible, isn't it? And yet what's bringing all those feelings and sensations and thoughts into the light is awareness. And yet we don't believe that. We never entertain that. We may just be that. Instead of being what's aware of, yeah, that we may be where the awareness of. Yeah. So for me, this was simple. It was, I hinted, someone introduced me to this idea. And I entertained it. I like to use that word because it's not, I didn't think about it because that's, as soon as you see people, they get an unspoken yes. You see them light up and then the next day they come back and they've thought about it and it's dead. It's like, you know, a stillbirth. Yeah? It's been neutered. The message got neutered because it's like here, the message is, you're a lion, let's say. So you hear the message. You're a lion. And everyone hears the message. You're a lion. So here's the message coming. You're a lion. You're a lion. You're a lion, you're a lion, you're a lion, you're a lion, you're a lion. It gets into the ear, I can become like a lion. That's not the message. You're a lion. Oh, I really like this message I'm hearing. What is it? Well, it sounds like I can become like a lion. No, that's not the message. The message is you're a lion. Okay, I'm really going to listen hard. You're a lion. I hear it. You're a lion. You're a lion. You're a lion. You're a lion. But it goes into the conditioning. I can become like a lion. That's not the message. Yes? This is not a becoming, it's not an acquiring, it's not an achieving. It's what's looking is what you're looking for. If you took the you out of that equation, it'd be clear as day. What's looking is looking for. So when I'm walking through the supermarket looking for some gluten-free bread, that's what's looking. When I'm looking for some toilet paper in a stall at the airport, that's what's looking. Yeah? When I'm looking at porno, that's what's looking. When I'm looking at scriptures, that's what's looking. When I'm looking at you lustily, that's what's looking. When I'm looking at you lovingly, that's what's looking. Yeah? What's looking is what you're looking for. Well, why can't I see it? I'm looking all over the place. Why can't I see what I'm looking for? Because what's looking is what you are looking for. Yeah, I understand that. But why can't I see it? What's looking is what you're looking for. So while you're looking for, that's what's looking how could that possibly be? It's me looking for. No, it's what's looking. And then the mental interpretation is it's you looking for. But that's what's looking. That raw information, that raw data, that raw consciousness is what I am. So it's like here, we come in this meeting and maybe it's a meeting about the ocean. Yeah, We're all sitting here very serious about having an experience of the ocean. Maybe some of us had great experiences of great oceans in the past, or, or a great ocean experience. But we're sitting here talking about ocean, but every one of us thinks we're an individual wave, let's say. Yeah. So we're sitting here as a wave, and we're trying to study the ocean so that we can know the ocean, or maybe have an experience of the ocean, and maybe we can make it really last long if we really practice hard. But would does it really do you that much good to learn everything about the ocean as a wave? Or would you rather just realize you're not a wave, and that's the ocean? So you can read tons of beautiful poetry about the ocean of bliss and eternal awareness and all this and all that, but it, it's sort of just the same thing. If you believe you're a wave, the dilemma isn't that you don't know enough about the ocean, it's you're knowing the ocean as a wave. Yeah? 
the wave is defined as something other than the ocean. Even though it is the ocean, it doesn't take itself to be the ocean, it takes itself to be a wave. So in that state of being a wave, you can be as dry as dry can be, seemingly. Yeah? And there's a huge urge to get wet, and you believe that if I really practice the ocean and study the ocean, I'll get wet. Yeah? But the whole point is, what would happen if you just looked at, am I a wave? If you're not a wave, that's the ocean. If you're not a wave, that's the ocean. What was taking yourself to be a wave, that drops and there's no having to rush ocean in. It is the ocean. Yeah? You don't have to go, okay, now I've realized I'm not a wave. Let's go look for the ocean. No. As soon as you see you're not a wave, that's the ocean. It's like instantaneously wet. And all the stories and all the investment in your head is in being dry. Yeah. <laughs> Gets dismissed and washed away in a nanosecond. Because there's no process or time. It takes no time or process for a wave to become an ocean. Not one second. What? Not one, no time, no process. Because it is the ocean. But not as a wave. Yeah? <laughs> if you just tell the truth about, hey, I may not possibly be that, that's what you are. Yeah, so clean. Most, see, most things are dualistic, so you think, all right, I want to be this. I want to know my authentic self. Yes? But that means you're unauthentic, trying to become authentic. Yes? This way, it's not like, oh, I'm not a wave, so now I'm going to become the ocean. As soon as you see you're not a wave, that's the ocean. Yeah? It cuts the whole dualistic uh, interpretation of processes and practices and times right out. It's not like, I'm not that, and now I have to say what I am. I'm not that is saying what you are, is seeing what you are. Yeah? The seeing of what I'm not is seeing what you are. That's the seeing of it. That's the act of being what you are, which is seeing. It's not, you can't see what you are as an object. The act of seeing what you're not is the living proof of what you are. It's the beingness of what you are. You're actually in the seeing of what you're not. Because you can see everything that you're not, but you can never see what you are. Never. It's impossible. You'd have to be something else to see what you are. But you can see what you're not. Because it's arising. It's arising in thought. It's arising in feelings. It's arising in objects. It's arising and arising and arising and arising and arising. And everything that arises, I am not. That's the act of being what I am. What more is there to do? Once the emphasis shifts from being an object to not being an object, that's it. You don't have to say, I'm the subject. That's way too far. You don't have to go anywhere. Because right now, you're in the living of the meeting of it all. You're in the living of it, yes? You don't need 800 pages of Scripture to verify it. It's like an unspoken yes that you know. There's a knowing prior to knowing mentally. There's a knowing, and it doesn't take any time. It's like an echo that just keeps reverberating. Yeah. You don't say, I'm not that. You just see what you see or sense what you are by recognizing what you're not. Because you can't see what you are. The eye can't turn around and see itself. So you get the sense of your own presence by your own absence. When I see I'm not this... That's the presence. Don't you ever feel it when you've been in a moment, let's say skiing or sex or snowball, snowballing or snowboarding? When, you're out, when you seem to be out of self, there's such an incredible presence, yes? And then the head always arises and tries to claim it and says, I just had this incredible experience. No, it didn't have an experience. It was absent. That was the beauty of it. It's now trying to claim its absence and make it an experience it had. But it was absent. And in so many days, you have so many free samples of its absence. All it takes is one for the emphasis to shift, and it's I'm not that instead of I am this. I am this trying to be not that. No, it's I'm not that. There is no this. Yeah.
No. No. No, no, you don't train your mind at all. You recognize you're not the product of the mind. Yes? You see the mind like you see a chair. You see it arise. You see what I call selfing. I don't believe there's a self. Yeah, I believe it's a mental verb, selfing. You see the selfing, and you see that selfing is a verb, but it implies and insinuates a noun. Yeah? When you're absorbed in the selfing, there's a sense that it's, there's a you, isn't there? There's a feeling of being a you. So a verb, which is selfing, gives a sense of being a noun, which is the self. But all it is is verbing. The inference of being a noun is just that. It's a mental inference. Fueled by your interest and attention because you're identified and hoping it's you. Yeah? Look, if I was in this... Well, I'm in this room now. Right? But let's say there's a lady in this room over here that I'm interested in biblically, right? I like to go out with her. And say. And, uh, but I'm afraid I don't want to get rejected, so I want to know if she likes me or not. So she's in the room with her friend, so I'm trying to listen to what she's... I'm trying to hear if she's saying anything, because, of course, being self-centered, I think she's going to be talking about me, yeah? And so I'm trying to listen. I'm supposed to be at this meeting, but I'm going... Yeah, and the people are going, hey, you're supposed to be at this meeting. I go, yeah, yeah, but my interest and attention is there, yeah? That means a lot to me, this lady. I think she's going to save me or whatever, yeah? probably going to have a kid by her, and she have not even talked to you yet, but I'm already married. Anyway. <laughs> so here I am. And someone says, hey, Paul, you're supposed to be doing this talk. I said, yeah, I agree, I agree. And someone brings me a book, How to Not to Listen to Conversations in Another Room, and I page through it. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I understand it, but I can't seem to help myself. Yeah. My interest and attention is going there. Then I finally hear a talk, and she's talking about a guy. I'm very keen, but it's a guy named Matt, and my name's Paul. What happens with my interest and attention? It leaves that conversation in the other room like that, yeah? I don't have to take three months of a workshop how to stop listening to conversations in another room. I lose interest immediately. It just goes, shoot, and then the interest and attention gets brought somewhere other than there. Why did I lose intention, interest and attention in that? It wasn't about me. When you see selfing as not about you, you'll lose interest in it. It's boring as hell. The daily narrative, it's the same old, same old. The same yapping all freaking day. Really, it is. If you would come over to my house and talk about five minutes of your selfing, I'd be bored stiff. I'd be like wanting to do my laundry very quickly. <laughs> just, just unbelievable. But I've been listening to it for 40 years, thinking it's very novel and very, very interesting what my head has to say. No, it isn't whatsoever. It's only interested to me. In, it's only interesting to me, to me, yeah, to me. It's like here, if we had a movie tonight, and it was about the life of Paul, and, we had a, and I had a marquee outside, I bet you maybe 40 Pauls would come, hoping it was about them, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and a couple, and a couple of women who went out with Pauls, who wanted to be right, came too. <laughs> Let me see what a scoundrel that guy was, I'm sure of it. So now we're on the room, and <clears throat> the movie's going to start, and everyone's quite interested in it. Yeah, we're all sitting there. Two hours of Paul, that's good, man. Two hours about me, yeah. We're all sitting there. But I know it's about me. So I make sure the doors lock, you know, and everything. <laughs> and everyone's eating stale jujubes and terrible popcorn, but they don't care because they're excited. They're interested. They're attending to the movie. As soon as the movie starts and they realize it's not about them, what happens? They lose interest in it, don't they? Immediately. They don't have to go, let's practice how to lose interest in it. No, you lose interest like that. Why? Because it wasn't about you. The same thing with that head going off all day. If you entertain, it wasn't the thing it's obsessing over and dwelling over and the whole center of the whole system of thought, the idea of being a self was not you, your interest and attention would be freed from that. That's the sense of fucking presence. When the center... The attention and interest, it's like here. Here you are. So my attention's going out. I see you, yes? And then some of the attention goes back. And what it usually runs into, it's like a mirror. Yeah? It's a, a mirror. But one side of the mirror is opaque. Yes? So it only reflects this. It reflects everything, all things. Yeah? Thoughts and everything else. So now my attention is seeing everything and seeing all these reflections. And when they're brought back, 
by my attention, what did they hit? They hit the opaqueness of the mirror, which is a big picture of me, a big, like, billboard. Yeah? So my attention goes out, meets everything, but it comes back and hits me. This is called a loop of self-importance, if you haven't felt it, yeah? When you have a good day, it's, that loop got a little bigger, really. You feel a little more spacious that day because maybe you did something for someone else. I don't know. You know? Maybe you did, worked at a soup kitchen or something. You got out of yourself a little bit, and you feel, wow, I feel much lighter today. The loop just got bigger. But here's the attention, and then the attention hits this thing, and then it hits the, the idea of being a Paul, a body. And then goes back out and keeps going into this black hole of self. But that mirror is two-sided, really. Your mind's ability to reflect is two-sided. Yes? It's not just reflecting things, but it's also going, the, the attention or the awareness is going through. If you're not identified with the opaqueness of the mirror, it's two-sided. That attention interest goes into what? Space, infinity, who knows, yeah? And then it creates a credible, credible circle. It doesn't go boom, boom. It's yes. And that interest and attention, what it brings to your life from that journey there, is a richness that you don't have when you're tending only to things. Yeah? When you're tending only to things, you're going to get bored. You're going to get terribly disappointed. You're going to get uninterested in it. Yeah? But when this attention goes back, it just goes where? I have no idea. But what it does is it produces a richness in the movement of it. Yes? So your awareness is now... Instead of hitting that black hole and all that interest and attention being enslaved to the idea of being a self. So where is most of your interest and attention? In your mind, isn't it? In the thought system. Yeah? You may be having a terrible pain in your foot. You wouldn't know it until you touched it, but you're probably very aware of most thoughts you're having right now. You're sitting here, and when you walk in a room, you're usually attending to the thinking about who's going to be in the room, or did anyone see me? Is my pants too short? Is my zipper up? Or whatever. There's always a concern in the thought realm. It's like a porno theater, in a way. So most of us are sucked up. Our interest and attention is in the thought system. And the thought system is really living in what's not happening. Yes? So, let's say right now, you're in next Friday. And in what's not happening, anything can happen. Yeah? You have to remember that's a quality in what's not happening. Anything can be happening in what's not happening. So next Friday, you can have cancer. Next Friday, you could be destitute. Even though you're healthy as hell right this moment, it won't have any effect on you because of your addiction to the mental realm. Yeah? you'll be reacting to what's not happening. And that reaction will be downloaded into an experience here. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah? So, you're going into what's not happening, which is not happening, yeah? So here it is. What's not happening, which is not happening, anything can happen in it. So you go to an imaginary, you don't, your mind does, goes to an imaginary field and gets concerned about being destitute next week, and then bring and harvests a crop from that imaginary field and produces it in your body. Yeah. So you feel tight, you're a little sweaty, you're not really here because you're there. Yeah. Now, thank God there's something called what's happening. Now, it doesn't, you know, it has only one quality what's not happening doesn't have, which is it's happening. Yeah. So in that sense of happening is the seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching. Yes. Which dominates the thinking. In the other realm of what's not happening, the thinking dominates that. So thinking becomes way, way more important than consciousness. In the moment, it's easy to see consciousness precedes everything else. But in the mental realm, you are the supreme being. You as a self. So in this whole idea of what's not happening, so let's say people are flipping out about next week. And they're taking pills to get over the anxiety what's not happening is producing. Yeah? Isn't that insane? So you're buying a product now, spending $50, and taking an Oxycontin or something to give you relief from what's not happening. <laughs> then maybe you become an addict to the relief from what's not happening, and now you've got something that's happening now, which is addiction. <laughs> It 
it's insane, man. So, what would be the solution to what's not happening? What's not happening? Yeah? What would be the solution to what's not happening? Recognizing it's not happening. If you recognize it wasn't happening, what more would you need to do? Are there therapists that deal only with what's not happening? <laughs> Probably, yeah. So, you could go, they'd be out of a job. Because your solution would be, what's my solution to what's not happening? It's not happening. All right, what do I do after that? I don't know. Shop, go wherever, go to the store. I have no idea what you're going to do. But you're not going to be reacting to what's not happening. You'll be, so you must be responding to something else. Yeah? How about with, to what's happening? Maybe there will be a totally different sense of being here if you're not spending all your day reacting to what's not happening and you're just responding to what's happening. Maybe at least you'll be on a certain square that you're close to on the game board. (laughs) Instead of thinking about all these great philosophies, just get located where you are. I'm probably better off. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) You you have something... Some people have so important questions, but where they're coming from is what's not happening. There's no answer there. The only answer to what's not happening is not happening. The only answer to I am not that is the seeing of it. That's it. Yeah? Immediately, if I'm not that, that's the activity of being what you are, which is seeing. Not a seer, but seeing. It's a verb. There's no way you can claim it. Just like when someone puts a flag in a river, how could they claim the river? Yeah? Is the river that one location where they put the flag on it? Isn't it just all this movement, all this water moving, moving constantly, and we just give a conceptual name to it and we call it a river? But the same thing. The sense of being or being on or conscious is a verb. Yeah? There's no noun called consciousness. Like it's a place you can visit. It's a verb. It's a living of it. And that's the transmission. It's a living transmission. It's transmitting all the time because it's of no time. It's available right where you are with no requirements necessary to access it because you are that. Yeah? So like this thing, Leah, let's see where the chair. So let's say this chair. Now I'm going to use mind as space, yes? So don't get into the atomic molecular structure of space. So just using it as a metaphor. So here's this chair. Forty years it's been here. Many important asses have sitting here. You know, a lot of very profound things have been said from this chair. And uh, let's say I move it away. I move this chair away. Now, once I move it away... The only way you would re- you would have to remember it, right? You don't see it anymore. So memory would be what was telling you that there was a chair here. And now if you look at the chair, where would I see the chair's effects? On the floor, right? You may have marked up the floor. And if it had rubbed up against the wall, it would have like this, it would have left a mark. Hopefully I didn't do that right now. Yeah? But would it have any effect on space? In other words, if I took this chair away... Would I have to move space back into the place that the chair was taking up? You know what I mean? I'd have to say, look that way, and then run to the closet, get the space. I won't see this, nothing, no space missing. No? It was almost as if, and the only effects this chair has is on other appearances, yeah? On the floor and the wall. It doesn't have any effect on the space, does it? It doesn't take up any space. It has no effect on the space whatsoever. It's like the sky. The sky. Fourth of July explosions. Do they ever rip the sky open? What we call the sky? When it rains, does it, if the rain hits the earth, does it hit the sky? Does the sky get wet? When a plane's flying through, did you ever hear them call up the terminal saying, hey, I just hit a big piece of sky up here? What to do? No. Everything appears in the sky, but none of what appears in it affects the sky. Yeah? That's sort of like the sky-like nature of like, oh, of mind. So the same thing, this chair, what's the difference between this chair and me? Well, what's really, let's say a bug gets born at 
eight o'clock in the morning, and then uh, he gets squished by eleven. So, and his actually his life, he missed half his life. He was supposed to die at four, so he doesn't have sex or anything. Yeah, but he, he was just like the chair, right? The insect showed up, it appeared, and then it disappeared. What's the difference between this and the chair? You don't know I was here except by memory if I walk out of the room, do you? Can't see me, can't hear me, can't feel me, can't taste me, but you remember me. Have you ever woken up in the morning and you remember your, you know, haven't looked at your room, but you remember your room? You remember Toronto and you remember the streets? Did you see any of them or hear any of them, feel them or touch them? Your mind just creates a box that you live in already. Yeah? You don't even open your eyes to see the room. You know the room, don't you? And you know how you look, don't you? As a body. Yeah, 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 yeah. So here, what's the difference between me and the chair? Nothing. I'm an appearance as this. As a you, I'm an appearance. Just as this chair. The only place I have can have an effect is on other appearances. Yeah? I can't hit the fucking space here. Strip it, but I can hurt you if I hit you. And you can hurt me. Yeah? I go, wow, this is really solid because and that implies I'm really solid. But I can't affect the space, can I? I could go to where I did the most heinous act of my life when I was a kid, and there's no mark of it in the space where it happened in. There's no plaque in the space, you know. Like, let's say I had an accident, like, there's a mark on the tree where I hit the car, hit the tree, but there's no mark on the space. Don't you see that as our nature? The spaciousness of that mind or of that consciousness? Yeah? And whatever is arising in it or appearing in it, no matter how it seems to have such reality because it can affect other appearances, can it affect what's really so? Does it leave any mark on the space that it's appearing in? To me, that's what we are. We are that space, that awareness. Whatever happens here has no effect on it. But the intimation of that can have a lot of effect on what happens here. So by seeing the absence of this is the presence of that in my life. Wanting to have an experience of that just reinforces my reality. Yeah? So, when I want to have as a solid person an experience of space, it's reinforcing that I'm a solid person. But when I see maybe I'm not a solid object, yes, then that's the space, clean. Yeah? So, if I'm not that, then the activity of seeing I'm not that is the space. That's the activity of space. And it's an immediate transmission because you sense it. It's like a sense. Just like you have a sense of of, of a self now, there's a sense of not being a self. It's not a sense of not being a self. It's a sense of the absence of this. So what happens? Who knows? But you'll find out. Yeah. The sense of that mental security of knowing gets dismissed and you live life finding out. <laughs> it's a much more, more direct knowledge when you find out about something than you know it. Yeah. When you know it, it's like preemptively neutering it basically. But when you find out, you're entertaining, you're open. And then it tells you, not it, whatever, I don't know how this intimation occurs, but you get sort of bleached from the inside out, not trying to take fake dyes and put them on, but this dyes you from the inside out. Right? It, it, it colors the cloth of your life from the inside out, not trying to color it from the outside in to make yourself something. But this dismantling of the idea of being you just spreads, yeah? yeah? 
is palpable. Yeah? You have a sense of it. Yeah? It's not just that it's embodied in a way. This is lucid dreaming. They're talking about lucid dreaming in that stage. This is lucid dreaming. Well, there is no conscious and unconscious. It's one. It's there's not even one. There's nothing. All right. <laughs> I agree. No, so there's none without a first. First without a, There's not one without a second, in my view. I think it's none without a first. Just like non-duality doesn't mean all there is is oneness. It means not two. That's all it means. Non-dual. Not two. have to find out. Yeah. It doesn't add, for me, there's no rule of, there's not this, therefore that. There's just this. Yeah. I don't know what will happen. But you can't apply, like, the system of thought and interpretation based on self-centeredness. That's why people think, I believe, call things they don't understand paradoxes. It's just that their system can't make sense of something. That's totally sensible, really. <laughs> but in our way of thinking, things that are totally sensible seem paradoxical. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I don't know how it's going to turn out. That's what I like about finding out. Once you believe, once there's a setup of wanting to know, it's like a, a noun can never know a verb. It can never know a verb because it's taken itself to be the noun. <laughs> so anytime a noun starts looking at a verb, it neuters it, really. So when I start looking at, when I as this start looking at being, just like people, they think. You know, there's a lot of books about how to get into the moment, but really, you can't be out of the moment if you look at it. Yeah? So, would you see that trying to get into the moment would be the way of acting like you're out of the moment? Wouldn't you see that? Just like people say, oh, obsessing with self is the root of the problem, so now they take a two-year course on how to stop obsessing with self, but isn't that another form of obsession with self? <laughs> how, self can't get out of self. No matter how tricky it wants to be, it's always within the content. Self can't get out of self. Being not that is contextual. But self can never get out of self. One of the things I used, I found out, Ramana Maharshi had a beautiful saying. He says, all right, a lot of people have this, this sense where they're sitting in a movie theater and they're watching the movie. And they, they realize it's super clear it's not real. Yeah, This is not real at all. And here they are, they're in the auditorium, sitting there, and they're watching the movie of life, and they're very clear it's not real. But then Rama and Maharshi, but then there's a sense that you're real, seeing it as unreal. Yeah? Maharshi said, the circle's bigger than that. The auditorium, you sitting in there thinking it's unreal, and the unreality of the movie is also unreal. <laughs> yeah? There is no place where there's an authentic self. There's no place where you get an authentic view as a you. It's always, it's always trying to claim any vision yeah, that it's claimed of being not what that is, but as of someone that you are. Yes? So the self is always replicating itself. 
and and then what happens is the circle will show itself to be in the content, and then another aspect of it will rise and claim that. Oh, look at all this. Now I'm getting closer to the authentic self. No, no. And it can never get out of the content, ever. Never, 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 never. So self can't get out of self. That's the whole beautiful message. The best way to get out of something is realize you were never in it. You have never been a self. That's the only solution to getting out of self. So nice, man, because it's immediate. It takes it right out of time. You just whack right here, and you find out. The head may be thinking, how am I going to do this? No, it has nothing to do with it. It's just a finding out. Yeah. <laughs> when you go, then when you see the ways of knowing, they're like frozen food. Really. You're going over like frozen food. Oh, yeah, that look at description of that great thing, but it's dead, fucking frozen in conceptual time, and, you know, but the knowing it is like an unspoken yes, it, it just, uh, there's a knowing that's so instantaneous, there's no sense of unknowing in it, yeah, it's a knowing that has no opposite in it. It's like, to me, I call it an unspoken yes. It's just something. Didn't you ever have it when you came into maybe a meeting? Now, I'd love it to happen tonight, but probably not. But you come into a meeting and you hear something and there's an aha, you know, a strong thing. That's the whole message. That, that eruption, that's it. All that is, is now it will seem to translate in time in a life called you. But in fact, that's the whole enchilada, is that acknowledgement of mind seeing its original face, which isn't the billboard, yeah? So instead of reflecting, and then when it looked back at itself, it sees you, <laughs> this image, it sees its original face, like in Zen, which is that infinity, in a sense, yes? It sees its original face. Obviously, you can't see your original face. It's the seeing, that's the original face. The seeing. Yeah? And it doesn't just have to be that seeing, it's both seeings, yeah? Same, same seeing. It's not, I've got to stop seeing all this shit, and I've got to deny this and give up my possessions. Like Ramar also said, don't you, have to, don't, you don't have to give up your possessions, give up the possessor. Look at your, let's say, look at your relationships in your life. All right? Maybe I had 12 intimate relationships, and none of them went well, let's say. Now, when I look back on them, what was the one constant in all my intimate relationships? <laughs> I could say women, but there was 12 different women. But there was supposedly one me. You know what I mean? So maybe it isn't that, and maybe it's this. Or just how many problems have you had in, all of that in your life? How many? How many this week? No, no, far out. There you go. That's good. <laughs> well, let's say you had 100 problems in the last three months. But there was only supposedly one you having them, yeah? Why would you want to spend all that time looking at the problems? Just look back. If that looking back sees I'm not that, then then how what meaning is given to things will change dramatically, and that's what we're doing here. Anyone know the Course in Miracles here? Course in Miracles, the second lesson says you and I have given everything all the meaning it has. It's just a perceptual axiom. So you and I all day, this world is all based on seemingly. It appears true or false to you. That's what it does. There's no reality here. It appears to be true or false to you based on where you're looking at it from. So most people are looking at what we call life out here from self-centeredness. Yes? So that system of self-centeredness, is, which means everything pertains to you and this and that and that, is giving everything the meaning it has in our life. And we're reacting to those meanings and having experiences of those meanings and living in the mental states conjured up by those meanings. Yes? And taking it to be our life. What would happen if you realized you weren't a self, then that, all the meaning that would be given to life wouldn't be going through that lens of self-centeredness. It would be projected through you from another place, yes? And maybe the meaning it would splash out on the canvas would paint a whole new picture for you. And you would see it and have experiences of it and respond to it. But you'd be responding to something that was totally, inherently different now because of where the meaning came from. Yeah. 
most of us are in self-centeredness. And self-centeredness is a very small system. Maybe it has eight possibilities. That you'll be saved is one of them. That if I get this and get that, I'll be great. Yes, there's something like that. And we've, had, we've gone over every one of those possibilities, everyone in this room, probably over and over again. And we've been over every inch of self-centeredness. We've gone over every rationalization, excuse, every, you know, delay of delivery of happy, joys, and freedom. Oh, it'll be here next month when you go back to college. Okay, it'll work. Oh, it'll be here when you buy that house. Oh, you'll arrive when you get there. Yes, doesn't it? But when you ever put it on the dime, hey, where's the happiness? Oh, well, uh, it's backed up in the factory. It'll be there, though. Go back to school. Go to another meeting. Get that I am that book in or whatever. It's always, 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 always a slavery to it. And it never delivers the goods, really. Isn't it? Why, if, if you relied on a system that was reliable, you wouldn't have excuses, rationales, and blame. Because it would be working. Where do excuses, rationales, and blame come from? When something that is supposed to work doesn't work. Yeah? If you're relying on that something that's unreliable, one of the first ways to see its unreliability is it has a lot of excuses when what it promises isn't delivered. It has a lot of rationales when its promises isn't delivered. And it blames a lot of other people for its condition. Yeah? Sounds familiar? <laughs> That's called relying on self, which is unreliable. How do you rely on self? You take yourself to be one. You can't be more reliant on something. You can't be more reliant on a thought than to believe you are that thought. That's the farthest I think the mind can go. You know, people see movies, horror movies, where there's like a woman gets obsessed over a starlet, and uh, she starts dressing like her, and starts looking like her, and learns all her lines from her old movies. She goes out with her old boyfriends, and she starts killing her boyfriends, and starts killing everyone around her, and she, the obsession gets so extreme, extreme, she tries to take the actress's place, yeah? She's just, t but we, the mind has gone way past obsession. We're identified with what it's obsessed over. Yeah. We're identified with what the mental process has presented ourselves to be, a self. We're identified as it. When we're studying self, most of us are studying self as a self. And you don't know you're identified. Unless some grace hits you or you hear it from some outside source, you won't have a freaking clue because you're identified as it. Everything that's going on, you're taking it to be you. And then life represents all day, doesn't it? When you go home, what does your mind do? It represents the day a lot of times. If I wouldn't have done that, 50 different things. Jesus Christ. But I did do that. But I know you did, but if I didn't do that. Yes? But it did. <laughs> it's just insane. And you can't go to sleep and you take sleeping pills because it just keeps incessantly representing. That's all it does. The mind, identified with self, lives in interpretation. And interpretation takes time. Yeah. So when something happens, which is conscious contact, seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching, we're not really aware of that conscious contact. We're on a time delay waiting for the mind to interpret the conscious contact. So some people will go to work, and they don't know they had a bad day till 9 o'clock at night, even though they were there the whole day. But the head breaks the news to them around 9. Oh, I had a bad day at the job day. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I did have a bad day. You know? Well, why didn't you know it was bad when it was batting? You know? It's insane how we're out to lunch. So we're living in interpretation, basically. And there's time involved. So when the moment of conscious contact happens, we're not conscious of it. Because we have to get the message of that moment, the next moment. It takes that interpretation a little bit of time. So you get an interpretation of what happened, which is now not happening. Yeah? Let's say if you live a life, and you're habitually into living this interpretation, and you're waiting for the mind to tell you what happened, and you get to the point of dying, and the body dies, which means the narrator in your head dies, yeah? the voice box dies, dies with the body, the brain, yeah? 
you'll be in limbo, won't you? Because you will have missed the moment of death, and you'll be waiting for your head to tell you, hey, you just died, Paul, but, it, but the head's never going to say anything again. <laughs> so some Buddhist practices, that's all they live for is the moment of death. Can you imagine? You miss the boat. You miss the bus. You're waiting for it to tell you, you're dead, Paul. <laughs> But that's how we're dead now. We're dead to conscious contact and we're living in interpretation, aren't we? Jeez, it's like in this room. If we turn the lights out in this room right now, a lot of problems would arise. A lot of problems. You know, if you wanted to go to the bathroom, you probably wouldn't be able to find it. Because you can't find it. You can't see it. And you haven't been here before. And then you'd maybe hit some chairs and hurt your knees. And maybe you get people pissed off when you bumped into them. So what do we do? We just hunker down in the darkness. We take it to be real. So we get knee pads, you know what I mean? And someone's an entrepreneur selling maps of where the bathroom is. I was once here when the lights were on. I think if you go make a left and a right, you'll get there. But plan ahead. If you feel it, when you feel like you've got to go to the bathroom, start the trip. because you may, you know, So you're buying maps and knee pads and preemptively apologizing, oh, if I hit you when I'm walking, I'm sorry, I can't see. Instead of just turning on the freaking light. Yes. All the problems were based on darkness. What happens with darkness if the light comes on? It's just the absence of light. Then you see, do you need a map to the bathroom? You can see the how to get to the bathroom. I forget the knee pads. You know, I'm not gonna bump into you. I know I can go. Right now, we're just living on memory. The mind is just representing an interpretation of a dark fucking cave. Yes? The thought system is very, very small, totally based on you as a body. So if you're relying on that as your flashlight, you're never getting out of here. <laughs> I used to do this one. Here's God. Here's Heaven's door. So I go up to Heaven's door and I knock on it. No one's better. So, and God answers the door. So I'm, and I go, God, can I come in? And God looks right at me and says, Paul, can't come in. So this pisses me off a little bit. I walk away and I start practicing. First of all, I want to look the part, so I buy whites, you know, patchouli oil, and get that loving gaze. And, you know, I hate your guts, but you know, you're all idiots. But buy my book or whatever. You know. And then I think I'm ready. I go back. And I have a little bit you know, confident. Got my bag ready to go. I said, God opens the door very fast, too. <laughs> and I, go, I look at I go, can I come in? And he looks right at me. He says, Paul can't come in. So now, someone else, I go, I sort of get pissed off now, right? So I go out, start drinking and debauchery and everything like this. And then life washes me up near that door and something happens. I have a revelation, so I knock on the door, and God answers the door, and I say, God, can I come in? And he looks right at me once again, says, Paul, can I come in? And I walk right in. He wasn't talking to me. He was just making a statement. Paul, Steve, Mary, any identification as something can't come into heaven. Yeah. My exile was self-caused, yes? Because when he was just telling me a fact, I was taking it personally. When I had that awakening, I realized it wasn't Paul, and I walked right into heaven. That's what this moment is. The door is constantly open. The hand of that invitation is seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, touching. That's it. If you don't think that's love, something that's ever presently conscious until the day you die, constantly inviting you to be aware of that, I mean, I can't see anything more loving than that. That every second I'm here, what's looking... Is, is the you that's looking for. Yeah? That's why they call it the open gate, you know, or the, or the gateless gate. There's no gate. Yeah? Yes? yes? When you're uh, seeing, feeling, touching, whatever, you're still thinking. Well, you're you know, seeing the thoughts. When you're, not, when you're absent as the self, Nothing. You see them. That's your nature. 
Your nature to thoughts is seeing. Not the, your, your nature to thoughts isn't the thinker of them and or the object of them. You're not the objects of thoughts, nor are you the thinker of thoughts. Your nature of thoughts is seeing. You see thoughts like you see a tree. Yeah? Just like if my eye was looking out a window and a bird flew by, I'd see it. You see thoughts just like that. The mind sees a thought like an eye sees a bird. Yeah? It's the idea that you're the thinker of them, and or they're about you that bonds you to them. The thought does not bond you. It's the my that bonds you. Yeah? This whole life, the bondage to this seeming life, isn't the life, it's the my of it. Once the mind or the self claims life, yeah, time, let's say here, you put the word money here, yeah, and you put, let's say, spiritual practices here, or us, your, no, spiritual practices, and let's say relationships, and we look at them, they have meaning, don't they? Money, if you don't have money, they probably have more meaning than if you do, but money, spiritual practices and relationships. Now, and you feel it, it's all right, it's a little, there's some weight to money, it's important to you, yes, in this world. Now, add the word my, how much heavier is it? My money, my spiritual practices, my relationships. You see, that's it, traveling light, traveling heavy, the my. Thoughts do not bind you, my thoughts do. A thought is a thought, but is it, if it's my thought, it becomes a story, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Why can I have immunity to your thoughts, but I don't have immunity to my thoughts? Because I see them as yours, and that gives me an immunity to them. I see these as mine, and that causes me to be affected by them. Yeah. It's all mine. Selfing is the act of being identified as a self. That's the, 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 the definition to me of the verb selfing. The verb selfing is the act of being identified as a self. That's what selfing does. It it, it's the act of being identified as a self. So how you identify yourself is claiming. So body becomes my body. Time becomes my time. You ever have a girlfriend, and then she became your girlfriend, and then a month later you're up on stalking charges? Do you ever see that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sitting in front of their house all night watching. Did anyone come and see her? What happened? As soon as the my gets introduced into anything, weird shit occurs. Yeah? Your mind gets really crazy. So let's say... And, you know, you and I give everything the meaning it has. So let's say you have that spiritual conditioning and you believe the act of meditating is much more important than taking a shit or walking or doing shopping or anything. Yes? Once that act of meditation is raised to a height and given meaning, that has more of power to bond you than any fucking thing else. Yeah? Because now it has a huge amount of meaning to you. So let's say if you missed the meditation this morning, your interpretation of the whole day could be it sucks, and your storyline is because I didn't meditate this morning. You see? This is the claiming of life. It's not life. It's the claiming of it. It's not thought. Thoughts do not create the planet. The planet's gravitation, which is self, is what keeps the thoughts in orbit. Yes? Thought's nature is to come and go. That's its nature. It comes from nothing, and it goes to nothing. And then there's an awareness of it, yeah? At that point. But when, here's the thought, as soon as it becomes my thought, it's now, it's claimed, and it's given time, yes? Ooh, I've had this thought before, and I'm going to have it again. And this thought's really important to me. And this is about something that's really important to me. And your interest and attention gets wedded to that, Yes? And that interest and attention drawn into that activity causes you to be unconscious to conscious activity. But all there is is consciousness. That's the only solution. The solution is not to become conscious, because that is just the opposite side of being unconscious. So if you become conscious, and you believe you did something to be conscious, you still have the belief you can do something to be unconscious. So consciousness will not become a reliable state. It will be based on what you do and don't do, yes? But consciousness is a reliable state. Because all there is is consciousness. It's not the interpretation of the mental process into being conscious and unconscious based on you as the noun. No, all there is is consciousness. So you can't lose what you... See, if you don't have something, you can't lose it. If you didn't achieve something, you can't unachieve it. Yeah.
Anything that comes to you will go from you sooner or later, yeah? <laughs> There's no... T- Life is happening, not happening to you. That's the story of mind. Life is happening to you. No, life is happening. That's what's going on, yeah? There's a freedom in it. That to you is just like that. It bends everything. Life's happening, yeah, yeah. But life's happening to me. Ooh. Huge story. Yes? Yeah, but it's, uh, you know, like talking about the selfing and that, that it's clinging, you know, that by me to produce different experiences, right? Finding it, that's my, my thought, my, uh, my wife, my yeah. house, my money, my car, whatever. That, that, that's a very universal uh, Condition. conditioning happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's <coughs> what, you, what you were describing uh, it, uh, of, uh, of not of dropping the self is very rare. It can seem to be that way. But there's no dropping there's no dropping of the self. It's just seen not to be you. Right. If there's a dropping of the self, there'll be a you doing it probably. But there's no you involved in this. You just see you're not that. That takes the you out of it. Yeah? I'm not that you that thinks it can drop it or hold on to it. Yeah. Yeah. The the you, the the mental conditioning of that you is gonna think it can drop something. Because it believes it's holding on to something. And vice versa. What it can drop, it can pick up again. Yeah? It's always conditional. It has no stability in any state. Yes? Because it's got two sides. It's coming and going. Yeah? You're getting connected and then disconnected. Yeah? Isn't that the feeling a lot of time? You do a nice retreat, you feel connected. Then you go to work, you feel disconnected. That's the sense. But in a fact, this isn't about connected or disconnected. You are that. It doesn't play that game of have being an effect that can be conditioned into a non-effect. Yeah? It's a state prior to all this going on. Yeah? And to me, it's demonstrated by the seeing, the awareness that's in every present moment that we're in. That awareness is that to me. Yeah? That's its intimation. Yeah? And there's no who or what that's aware. There's just awareness. So, and you will have ample opportunity to see what you're not. That's the beautiful message. Because everything that arises, I'm not that. (laughs) And that's the act of being what you are. And it will translate into the way you travel. thing that something you're not describes itself all day to you? So that you can see it, that it's not you? That the, one of the only ways in a sense to have an ex, a, a sense of what you are is in the recognition of what you're not. Isn't that a wonderful grace that what you're not is constantly showing itself not to be you? By its mere arising? By its mere appearance? It's demonstrating to you you're not that. Isn't that incredibly beautiful in a way? That what you're not is constantly arising so that in the seeing of it, you are sensing what you truly are. What would happen if it wasn't arising? Who knows? Yeah. But by, you know, in a way, you, it's, like, look, it's like knowing yourself by looking at a mirror, but you, that's what you see. Yeah. So you see what's arising in the reflection of consciousness, and it intimates, I'm that, yes, which is not arising. So by looking at this, see, because if I'm looking at this and I try to look at that, it doesn't work. But if I'm looking at this and I say, I'm, I see that I'm not all this, that's that. Yeah. Yeah? But if I go like this, oh, 
I'm going to now look at this. It's the same thing. This and that, as you as the pivot, both are baloney. Yeah? But this, I'm not that, suspends the sense of being a you, and in that is the verb of seeing. Yeah? And it translates in you. Yeah? Boom. And then, maybe it'll take time, who knows here. But once, once, at one point, the emphasis of your attention and interest, you know, your emphasis will shift. And instead of being on things, being seen as a thing, it will be on no thing. And you'll sit there, and there was no, there was nothing the thing did for that to occur. It's just the mind shifts, yeah? The emphasis. You know emphasis? It's sort of like where there's importance on something, and it sort of makes something else not seem so, yeah? If you get so absorbed in something, you can seem like this is the only thing that's real, and what even what's real could be not known, yeah? The emphasis. So when the emphasis shifts, what was in the foreground moves to the background, and the background moves to the foreground. So now, how you were looking before, you're almost looking the other way. Yeah, 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 yeah. But your emphasis is more this way. Before it was all this way. And even when it went this way, it was still this way because it was hitting a thing, yeah? Yeah? So there's thing, 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 thing. Supposedly maybe going to no thing. Never getting back to no thing. Just hitting thing again. Paul. So thing, 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 thing. So now, it's no thing in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it translates. You have it. It's available now. You don't sustain it. What's absent is absent. That's what, the absence sustains itself. Yes? An appearance sustains its absence by being an appearance, doesn't it? By re- recognizing, like Huang Po, an old Zen master, said, whatever can be perceived can't perceive. So whatever can be perceived, whatever thing can be seen, can't be what's seen. Yeah? They're all simple hints to go to that no-thingness of the act of seeing. Yeah? Because obviously there is no seer. That's just a mental way of interpreting it. There's just seeing. We, every time the mind reacts to seeing, it, has, it believes there's got to be a doer. There's got to be a seer. There's got to be a haver. That's what it does. It senses a, the movement of a verb and makes a noun out of it. If there's a verb, there must be a noun. This is just verb, noun free. It's just seeing. Yeah. Where did it start? How could a seeing start? There's no beginning or end. Where do you enter it? Any place you are. When? Any time. Yeah? I mean, where would I have to travel to get to everywhere? <laughs> Literally, where would I start and everywhere to get to everywhere? And where's the center of everywhere? But everywhere. Yeah? <laughs> Why am I not sensing everywhere? I must believe I'm a special somewhere. That's the idea of being a self. Yeah? You're like a little gated community. And then you have concepts of everywhere, but they're being held by a special somewhere, which nude is the everywhereness of them. When you realize I'm not the special somewhere, that's everywhere. Every moment of the appearance of the special somewhere was everywhere. Yeah? Every moment of this appearance of the special somewhere was everywhere. So when it's seen that there is no special somewhere, it's immediately everywhere because it was never not everywhere. Yeah? Like the wave was always the ocean. It doesn't take one moment to get wet when it realizes it's not a wave. It's wet! (laughs) The solution doesn't take time. It may translate in this life as an action figure through time, but the solution doesn't take time. Yeah? I don't even want to call it a solution. That doesn't take time. Seeing is evident. Yeah? There's confusion here. When I, when I see that I'm not that, that's like it's not possible because the I is the 
one that's trying to see that I'm not that. So that, that's... When you try to see that you're not that. Yeah. There's just a seeing I'm not that. There's no I that's seeing it. There's just seeing, yeah? Isn't, isn't the sense of being a self just a claiming of verbs as something that you do? So why does there need to be an I that sees? There's just seeing. Yeah? I guess what I'm figuring is seeing doesn't need to know that it's not that because it's seeing. That's right. Well, that's the thing. But, why, but it sees that I'm not that. Because it's seeing. Yeah. Yes. That's the flavor. It doesn't need to know, but it sees I'm not that. Because it sees. It doesn't have a choice where it's aware or not aware. Yeah? It's awareness. That's its nature, or a nature. So it sees. To me, that's the first page and the last page of the scripture of the verb of seeing. It's the sense of seeing. The mind incessantly wants to know, but this is about finding out. You just entertain an invitation or a message and see what happens. Yeah? Some people are surprised because it really starts whacking them good. They were always expecting it was going to be another lousy solution that didn't work. And now they're getting <laughs> a lot of clarity is rushing into their lives. They go, oh, wait a minute, I don't know about this. That's the self thing arising. Yeah, watch out for what you ask for. <laughs> It's incessantly on. Yeah. Yeah. Like they say in the Bible, the Son of Man has no place to rest its head, like a fox has a den and a bird has a nest, but the Son of Man has no place to rest its head. Real security here is in the insecurity. Like in Zen they say the clearest mind is I don't know. That sense of being of being uncertain is what alertness is. That's what being alive is. The mind always wants to know. Did you notice it even here? Even in this place of time, how does a day get dealt to you like a, uh, like a deck of cards? Does, it, does the 4 o'clock card get dealt to you at 8 in the morning? No, you get one card at a time, yeah? And then you get the hand, and you play it, and then you get another hand. But what happens with the mind, the selfing? The mind wakes up and tells you how the day's going to be, doesn't it? It says, today's going to suck. As if it just saw all the hands that the day was going to present. Yes? You know what I mean? That all the hands. But this is insanity. The only way you know is by finding out. The only thing you can do is take some invitations and entertain them. And see what happens. If you entertain them and it starts translating far out. Even that's giving you, you and I too much credit. This is just about grace in a lot of ways. And for me, grace is not, you can't see it, but I'll tell you in a way, you can see it in a certain way by honoring it, yeah? So when there's a sense of that grace from nothingness, let's say, to honor it is a way of almost giving it like flesh and blood, yeah? You can honor it here in your little day of time and emphasis, yeah? So when something you get a sense of that, some, whatever that no thing is, it's almost like you can give it a form that you can embrace by honoring it. I don't know, maybe you'll honor it with candles, but I mean honoring it by entertaining it. Yeah. By just... And then when the mind arises to claim whatever position it thinks you're in, you see that as I'm not that. Yes? There's a seeing of it. Because now the seeing isn't, hasn't been inducted into a way of looking called self-centeredness. It's freed from the bondage to the idea of being a self. So now it's seeing isn't turned into a form of looking, which is really a way of being blind here, to your natural seeing. Yeah? And some of the ways of looking are to try to promote better looking, but in a way they really promote a blindness to the natural seeing, I feel. Yeah? So in this way, the seeing recognizes what it's not. Yes? And so, because the mind will arise. 
and it will try to claim, and it will try to give meaning to your life. It seriously will. It's not your life, but you know we have language here. And yet, you can see that arise. And in that arising, just because it's arising, you have a sense, I'm not that. Yeah? Because of its nature, which is that it's arising. Whatever arises cannot possibly be what I am. Yeah. It's not a thought. It's a, it, this is a seeing. It's not like an understanding. It's a vision. Yeah? It's not knowing. It's a vision. It's a way of seeing. You have vision now. You don't have another mental knowing, which is another way of trying to navigate the dark. You actually have vision. You see. Last week, last time we were here, this lady had such an incredible... Her face was one of the most entertaining things I saw. She, she had a certain face... The beginning of the day when we first got together Friday, and by Sunday, <laughs> it was such a nice joy. Yeah, just to watch what can happen. Yeah. yeah there's just a sense of presence available, so feast on it, you know. It's like a souffle, it's very tasty. <laughs> What would you call it over the room when there's a certain silence? What is that to you? Yeah, doesn't it feel different now than earlier? The room, the atmosphere of the room, doesn't it? Maybe it doesn't. For me, it does, yeah. There's the food. Yeah. Partake. That's it. That's, that's the more, that's, the words are just like a vehicle. That's the delivery. Yeah, just have that sense. Doesn't it feel different? Yeah. Maybe a lot more sound going on. The sound of that silence, yeah? You can feel like, you can almost hear what uh, allows sound to happen. Yeah? You can almost hear that now. It's like some of the foreground moves back and the background, which is the space, moves forward. And we're in it. Yeah? Partake. You know? Anna. I mean, if something uh, cannot appear but can be recognized, it's in the recognition of it that may cause it to appear more. Who knows? Yeah? What cannot appear but can be recognized, maybe through the recognition of it, it will seem to, quote-unquote, appear more. questions. Yes. The uh, saying, um, the world is illusory, Brahman, only Brahman is real, Brahman is the world. So God, I would say God, not Brahman, would be my word. So everything, this is all at the same thing, do you think? I don't care. We'll, don't worry about that. But that's what we're dealing with every day. This is what I'm seeing. Is it the same thing? Is all the same thing? Find out. Yeah? To have a concept about it is just another form of looking, yeah? It'll blind you to it. Find out. You entertain. Someone gives you an idea. Hey, maybe... Emptiness is form, and form is emptiness. All right, I'll sit around, walk around with that for a while, see how that works, yeah? But to try to, you know, this doesn't need an answer, yeah? It's just a, it's just a question in, in waiting, <laughs> yeah? The more answers, the more questions. Yeah? Let's be fed by something else, maybe, yeah? But you'll find out. If you're onto something, you'll know you're onto something. It's not going to be a dry belief or an idea or something you have to get rigid around and 
and profess a faith about, there'll be a translation. Yeah. I mean, it delivers the good, so to speak. It's not just a mental platter. It's not like a menu. It actually, it's in a sense, of, in a place of flesh and blood, it has much more substantiality than anything that's appearing. Literally. It has much more an impact. Nothing has much more of an impact than a, a ton of anvil falling on my head. Nothing this has much more of an impact than a, a ton rock. Delivering a translation. Well, here, this here, we're having an experience, yes, in this world of action figures. So, to me, certain things that are entertained translate here. So, in other words, they're almost like downloads, in a way. But the information doesn't go to your, your mental thing. It goes and gets digested and then regurgitated in a different way of knowing. Yeah? And that translates into this action figure how it, how its experiences here. Things get different. Yeah. So the idea there's a big pipe going. On. Sort of like that. It's like a download, and the download is like information, but not put into a conceptual framework. It's just something. I don't know. It feels like even when I'm doing a talk like this, it's just a huge download of energy in, through the action figure. And then that energy sometimes has a peculiar, peculiar sense of being a wave that's going to combine with other energy events, and then something will occur. So that's the translation of it. Because it's like no time translating into a place of time. Yeah. So it's like Jesus says, you'll know the tree by the fruit. You can't know the tree, but you'll know it by the fruit. Yeah. So a good tree can't bring forth bad fruit and a bad tree can't bring forth good fruit. You'll know the tree by the fruit. In other words, you can't know the tree because it's not knowable. Yeah? But you'll know it by its fruits. It will have an effect here if entertained. And you'll know that by its fruits. I call it traveling lighter. You'll just know that as, quote unquote, this, you're traveling a whole lot lighter over all the terrain life has to offer. Getting fired and getting sick and getting married, having kids, whatever. But all that terrain that people have as an action figure, you'll travel lighter over it. It doesn't say the terrain's going to change. You'll get fired and you'll get married and you'll get cancer or whatever. But you'll travel lighter through it or everything. And in that traveling lighter, that's a, a nice translation of what I, what's been entertained. Yeah? So that's, what I, that's what I mean by delivering the translation. This place is a translatable place. This is an interpretation. This is a place that's made up. It's a dream, really, isn't it? So mind or whatever is dreaming this place. So when mind dreams a new idea, it may express itself in the framework of this place through time yeah, and activities. So it looks like you may have done something, but it was, it was just a vehicle it had to use translating here. Don't you see? Yeah. We call it, we think how it may translate here as how what produces it. I don't believe that. I believe it just appears, and when it appears and has an effect on something that's appearing here, it sometimes affects it in this modality. Translate seems like it's getting deeper. Seems like I'm, the lens is clearer and it's getting wider. They're just experiences you have. Is it getting deeper and wider? No, but that's the feeling, you know? It's translating it, yes? So downloads are sort of like that to me. You're sitting there, and then suddenly you just get some information comes through. Lots, like one time I was at at uh, Joe's house, and I was sitting before the talk in his backyard, and suddenly a big download came over. I was just sitting there, and suddenly a lot of things. And then there's no thinking of it. It gets digested, and then I go in there, and it was regurgitated. I had nothing to do with it. It was just happening through and as this, you know, because this was the event. So, now is it coming from somewhere? I don't know, but that's how it gets translated through this. It feels like a download. It feels like, Jesus Christ. It's not you doing it. No, there's a lot of information coming in, but not conceptualized. That's why I don't like reading books or anything about this topic. I want it to be like a homegrown bakery, you know? 
have it come out a certain, this peculiar little way. I don't want to have all the concepts of, yes, this is unreal, that's unreal. How is that translating for you? It's really, you know, it's just burdening you maybe more. If you knew conceptually that this place wasn't real, you would still get pissed off when the newspaper boy missed your porch. Look at physicists. They, get, they study scientifically that there is no world, and they are probably having a huge argument with their wife about the roast beef that night. Yeah? They're totally acting as if it's real all day, yet they have tons of evidence it's not real. It's not translating, is it? That's what happens. We study, maybe, and we get information. Yes, emptiness is form, is form is emptiness, but is it translating? Do you sense, you know? I mean, who wants information? I mean, who? I don't want to be a professor of holes and keep falling in them. Yeah? <laughs> you know what I mean? The only reason why I want to learn about holes is not to fall in them. I have no desire to know a lot about holes. Yes? <laughs> I just don't want to fall in them. Hmm? <laughs> See, now you got to learn something. Now, most people will want to go there and find out. Yeah? I don't believe it. There won't be any holes for me. I'm way above holes, yes. No. I'm just happy to be here. What else are we going to do tonight? That's it. Any more questions? I appreciate the attention. Hope, you know. I'd love to ent- explore this and entertain it, yeah? Because all it needs is the mind's ability to entertain is unbelievable. That's why exquisite suffering can seem to be real here because of the mind that's entertaining it. You have to see the mind's uh, power, because, you know, we talk about, in, you know, they talk about Jesus brought back a guy named Lazarus from the dead, yes? He resurrected him. But at least Lazarus was alive at one time. We're bringing reality from what's not happening all day. We're thinking about what's not happening and producing what we call real effects in our real body, in our real life. We're bigger miracle workers than anyone else. We're taking something out of nothing. It's not happening, and yet it seems to be happening. (laughs) Give me a break. Can you imagine if that ability to entertain was freed from entertaining everything through self-centeredness and would be entertaining it free of that? Yes? Maybe you'd be able to entertain peace now. What boundary? Um, of being a person? Of, uh, being separate. Oh, yeah, yeah. It feels more like a protecting person. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like the bigger picture. Like you. My own eyes. Yeah, it's protecting you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wall protecting an imaginary figure. Right. That's where I keep coming back to. Well, if you see that you're an imaginary figure, then you see what, what projected the wall. You know, most people are in a mobile prison. They're not in a prison. Wherever they are, they're imprisoned, yeah? Because they're bonded to self. They're obsessed with the thoughts that are about self, or they're taking all the thoughts to be the one that's thinking them. That's called being bonded to self. That's yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it's, it creates a sense of feeling, and that authenticates its reality. But yeah. that's not true. Yeah, yeah, it feels like a lot of things, I know. It feels like a lot of things, definitely. But there's a seeing behind it all, yes? And it's available. Not to you, but as you. Not even as you, but as. And with that little bit of uh, invitation, that ability... Could you imagine when the mind, after being entertaining its self for so long, right? And then all of its ability to entertain being funneled into this world of possibilities in a very small spectrum of possibilities called self-centeredness. If it could entertain, I'm not that, watch what happens. So all we're doing is attempting to give the mind. We're dropping, we're putting a message through the door of your life. And of course, the mail slot is your conceptual framework. So self rushes up and grabs the message. But it may find no value in it and just throw it on the floor. And then mind may just see it. And they read it and go, I'm not that. <laughs> and when it entertains, I'm not that. That's freedom from that. Yes? Just like 
It's entertaining I am that is bondage to it. It's entertaining I'm not that is freedom from it. Yeah? The same entertaining, just like faith. Everyone in this room has tons of faith. But faith here in this place manifests by the vehicle it's put in. So if you have faith in your thoughts, you're going to be in a lot of anxiety usually. Yeah? If you have faith in not your thoughts, which is realizing you're not the thinker or they're about you, that faith, faith produces an ease and comfort now in your skin. Yeah? The one faith produces anxiety because you believe in the future and the, and the worthiness of it being worried about. And the other faith produces an ease and comfort in your own skin now. It's the same faith. The devotee of mind is like this. Instead of like this, they're like this. They're just worrying. <laughs> but they're just as devoted as anyone else here. Seriously, more devoted. They believe every freaking thought. They're just totally into just being whacked like a whack-a-mole all day with what's not happening. When you, and the reason why is the identification as the self, being the thinker of them or the thoughts about them. If you can see you're not the self, it frees you from that. Yes? So the same thing that's binding you is what frees you. The ability to entertain. You've been entertaining your this for a long time, and now you can, maybe you can entertain, maybe I'm not that. In no time, and see what happens. It's going to produce an effect here. You know, I, you've been served the spiritual subpoena. <laughs> My job's done. There you go. Bingo. Because this happened to me. Someone int- introduced it to me. And, uh, you know, here in, the, in, this, in this realm, I, I honored that. And so, I, you know, it's my seat assignment to enter, you know, invite other people right now. It may change after this retreat. Who knows? No one will come back tomorrow. It will change. But you know what I mean? It's just this, an invitation because I had no idea. I was practicing a lot of quote-unquote spirituality and I had no fucking clue that there was a template over everything that I was the doer of this stuff to get an advantage from this stuff. And man, I could never, I couldn't see outside that. I couldn't. So I was meditating 13 hours a day in Thailand and tons of freaking shit all <laughs> getting bit by mosquitoes and eating terrible soup before 8.30 in the morning and I was it. Lost 20 pounds and everything like that. Just, but I looked really high, you know. Felt a lot of spiritual experiences. But nothing radically changed. The same old, same old. Yeah? And I just couldn't believe it. It went on for 9, 10 years. And um, I had no idea what was going on. And someone I invited me, they, you know, instead of looking for another meditation technique, Paul, why not see who's the meditator? And that changed my direction. My attention, instead of going out here, went into question, all right, that question, who am I? And I started to entertain what I was hearing, and uh, I didn't think much about it. I just entertained it. When I heard it, I was like, walked around, and then something... Downloads occurred, and then things happened, and then the emphasis shifts. And then things get really different. Yeah. But, you know, I was. I feel like I have enough. See, the greatest thing I was ever devoted to here was drugs in my life. I'm an alcoholic and addict in my life, yeah. I was an intravenous drug user, and. I can never say that I was a really great spiritual practitioner, but I was the perfect drug addict. I was totally devoted to cocaine. More than you're devoted to any guru you've ever had. I devoted, I gave my whole life to it. I gave all my money to it. I gave your money to it. (laughs) I, I did anything, and I was relentlessly devoted to that. And, you know, I had a belief I could transcend this place by getting loaded. I really did. It's insane. But I gave it the best shot, and I'll tell you, there's no transcending this place. Self cannot get out of self, because it's an imaginary condition. So, when someone entertained this, it was just uh, far out. <laughs> Jesus Christ, my seeking came to a screeching halt in a great way. <laughs> Polishing the mirror doesn't create its reflection. Yeah? 
ability to reflect isn't produced by you polishing. And dust is something that the mirror is reflecting. It's not causing it not to reflect. It's just what's being reflected in a very small space. Yeah. They're still seeing there. Nothing in this world can cloud the seeing. Nothing. Nothing. No karmic tendency or anything can cloud it because even that's being seen. The nature of mind is to reflect. And dust is what's being reflected. There's still the nature of mind reflecting. And that can be sensed. Yeah? yeah. So, I hope you come back tomorrow, whatever. What are we going to do tomorrow, yes? And uh, thank you for coming here tonight. I'm really happy to meet everybody. And uh, we have DVDs and stuff back there. They're not the most professional ones, but there is one that was made by a Stillness Speaks. You ever hear of them? Dot com. I did a long interview with him, and they just brought a, brought, came out with a DVD. There's two of them there. And then I have all these little ones I just did of meetings I do with the computer in front of me. And they're cheap. They're pretty nice. I just did about, I made as many as I could last night before I left. So if they don't work, and you get nothing. Ha, yeah, that was the message. <laughs> <laughs>